Welcome to the Progressive Learning Platform Libraries and File Separation Tutorial. The goal of this video is to familiarize you with POP libraries, specifically what functionality is included and how do we use them. How do we go about making our own files? What is different about them? How to use them? And why to use them? By now, we are becoming relatively proficient programmers with POP Tool, but there are a few items that we can make use of to make our programs a little more robust. All of the programs we have written in previous tutorials have resided in the main.asm file that POP Tool makes for them. We can make our own files to hold blocks of code. This is very useful in making our programs more modular and storing code in a place that we can easily use in another program. Aside from the ASM files that we export ourselves, PLP Tool comes with several library ASM files. We can import and use these provided utilities which help limit the rewriting for, of code for those functionalities that are used often, such as the UART operations or the seven segment display. To see the libraries that are provided, right click the source files folder in the navigation pane and click import ASM file. Navigate up one level and double click the LIB PLP directory. Here you'll see the listing of the libraries available, including one titled LIB POP UART ASM. This holds all the functions to read and write to the UART similar to how we did it in our previous tutorial program. You may be wondering, what is different about using these other files than staying in our current file? There's actually no difference in executing a function in another file. When your program is assembled, it actually ends up being stored sequentially by instruction with no regard for which file it's in. What it does provide us with is a way for us to read and or reuse our programs much more easily. As you no doubt have already seen, debugging assembly can be quite cumbersome, even with useful comments. If we keep our related functions grouped into their own ASM files, we, and anyone else reading our code, have a much higher chance of recalling what it does. To create our own ASM, right-click anywhere in the file navigation pane and select New ASM File. Simply just name it and you are done. This is the file that will house our function that calculates the polynomial that we are using in this demonstration. As you can see, our new file is added to the list of source files for this project. So let's go ahead and open our created file and write the code that will be used to calculate our polynomial. For simplicity, we chose a polynomial where when x is between 0 and 4, the equation will equal a single digit number. This will just make it a little easier to display a number on the seven segment display without spending too much time on that part of the program. We will need a label so that we can call the function from elsewhere in our program. A label in another file works the same as any other label, as a target for our program to jump to. The convention is to use the register A0 to store past values, so that is where X will be. Let's store each of the first three terms in its own temporary register and then add them together. You could just add them to the return register B0 as you calculate each term and then reuse that same temporary register for calculation. But I think this way will help with clarity. For this calculation, we have to do multiplication, which we can do in a couple of different ways. The MULO instruction gives us an easy way to multiply the contents of two registers. Though, since we are now a little more familiar with POP, we can begin to think of more efficient ways to do things. The MULO instruction is more expensive hardware-wise, so if we can accomplish the same calculations with a few shift and addition operations, a larger scale program would have a better performance. For example, for two of these terms we need to multiply by 5. Shifting is one of the least expensive hardware operations, so if we use shift left twice, we will get the term multiplied by 4, and then adding one more will give us the term multiplied by 5, without using any multiplication. Once we have all of our terms calculated, we will add each one into the return register, v0. Now we can move on to our main source file and write our main program that will utilize the two existing libraries and the new one that we just created. Because of how limited we are in the number of registers we have to work with, we'll often need to store information to memory or on the stack, which is most easily done through the stack pointer. We will need the stack pointer in order to hold memory addresses that we will save our registers to before calling the library function. 
Since this program is for demonstration purposes, it isn't as long and doesn't use as many registers as a program with a little more substance would. That being the case, we have to save some registers that wouldn't really make sense in a typical program, T0 and T1. This brings up an issue that we haven't had to worry about in writing our programs, though. If we're using someone else's code, how can we be sure that the registers that we store data in aren't overwritten by the functions that we call? The answer lies in saving the state of our registers before using such a function. We can approach this in a few ways. We can look at the function ahead of time and determine which registers it will write over, then store our contents of those registers on the stack. But since we may not always know ahead of time how the function we are using is organized, this isn't always the best solution. Another option is knowing the register conventions and using the correct ones that will not be overwritten by a function whose author had these conventions in mind. This would require some trust in the function's author, as well as adherence to these conventions when we write our own function. This isn't always the safest route because, especially in larger functions, more registers may be required than are allotted for temporaries and the author may have to spill over into others. Probably the best way to ensure our register values remain intact is to save the state of the registers that we know are still being utilized in our own program before allowing execution of an external function to take over. It's safe to assume that our temporary or T registers will never be intact after a function call. Within its execution, any temporary values needed as part of the algorithm will likely be stored in these registers. Anything that we wish to save should be in S registers, if the given function requires arguments, we can use the A registers to reserve up to four of them. And finally, any return values from the function will, should be stored in the V registers. One method for using the stack shown here is to save the register and then decrement the stack pointer, which was initialized with the address at the top of the available memory. Save another register and keep going until all desired registers are saved. We will see another method of using the stack when we retrieve the data. The first thing that we need to do is retrieve the input off of the UART. To use the UART library, all we have to do is know the label from the library that we would like to use and jump to it using the jump and link instruction. What this does is save the location currently in the program counter plus four into the RA register and then updates the program counter with the address of the first instruction pointed to by the label. At the end of the UART function, it stores the result in the register V0 and uses the jump to register, or JR, to jump to the address stored in the return register RA. This will bring execution back to our main program. The value returned from the UART then needs to be the argument that we will pass to our created function, so we need to copy it into the A0 register. Using the OR instruction with 0 is a good way to do this and convert it from ASCII to its decimal value by subtracting 48. This works for all digits 0 through 9. Now we can call our function and take the return from that and pass it on to the 7 segment display. Now that this part is complete, we can restore the state of the two registers that we saved. An alternative to the method we used earlier is to start at the bottom of the stack which can be calculated by multiplying the number of registers you want to store by 4, since memory is a byte addressable, then subtracting that from the top of the stack and saving it to the stack pointer register. You can then use the offset to traverse the stack using multiples of 4. It is always a good idea to restore the stack pointer back to the top after using for easier tracking. We then want to put an infinite loop at the bottom of main because all of the instructions are stored in memory as if they were all in one file, even though we are using four separate files here. If we did not include this loop after the program executed the final instruction in the main, it would then continue to the first instruction of the next file, in our case, the UART library. Finally, we need to go back to our function and add the jump return instruction to the end of our function so that it will return execution back to our main program. And now our program is complete. Okay, so now let's go ahead and assemble and simulate our program. We need to open the seven segment display and the UART.
but we are also going to show the watcher window so we can demonstrate that our state is saved and restored properly and also create a memory visualization for the stack that we created. To do this, go to Simulation Menu, select Tools, and then create a POP CPU Memory Visualizer. What we have to do now is give it a base address and an offset of how many bytes you want to display. Our stack only has a size of 2, but we'll want to view a few extras just to see what the visualization looks like. We're just going to step through this program so that you can see everything that is happening. Like my misspelling of feed. I'm going to go ahead and put a 1 in the UART and send it. This will ensure that it is in the UART buffer as soon as our program begins. A value of 1 set through our function should return a 5 and then post this on the 7 segment display. The first thing that our program does is set the stack pointer, and you can see that the memory visualizer marks the current stack pointer with a red arrow. As you can see as I'm stepping through the program, control is jumping between the different ASM files that we are using, and also that the T0 and T1 registers take on different values as they are saved to the stack, used within these programs, and then restored at the end. I'm going to go ahead and continue stepping through the program until the end, and if everything was done properly, the seven segment will display the proper answer. All right, so we got the right answer. Our T0 and T1 registers have been restored, and the stack pointer has returned to the top of the stack. This now concludes our video. Thank you for watching.